I um, want to tell you a little bit about the startup that I had, which was based out of Berlin here, so that's why I'm very excited to be back here. Uh, I still do have an apartment here, but I haven't like, visited it since like, at least like four or five months, so I'm not spending much time here anymore. But I want to talk about three things today, and I'll give you like a quick introduction what, what I'm doing now, but then I want to talk a little bit about the company that I, that I co-founded here in Berlin with Scobbler. And then the second thing is I want to talk a little bit about the transition I did now to like Silicon Valley and what I'm doing now around like self-driving cars and things like that. And then I want to talk a little bit about the differences that I've learned from like being in the Berlin tech ecosystem and being in the Silicon Valley tech ecosystem and what are kind of like things that I learned. And then hopefully open that up for discussions that you can say, oh, this is bullshit. It's totally different here. You have not been here for many years now. We're like way more aggressive and everything is like fantastic here. Come back from Silicon Valley. I don't know, which I want to do anyway, but that's a separate discussion. So uh, to start uh, with a very quick introduction about myself before I'll go into the story. So I've, I've been like a techie and an entrepreneur most of my life. So I think this is now the first really good, serious job that I have for, for a few years. So I started like hacking like computers when I was super young. When I was 16, I had the first um, and like one of the biggest German computer hacking websites and I started my first company when I was 16 as well with the reason because my father had a small law firm and like I was always debating with him about like entrepreneurship, how you can make it bigger and at some point in time I said like he should grow it like instead of like a five people law firm to a hundred people law firm and I didn't understand why he would manage to be like home at six for dinner instead of like growing his firm bigger and my father got so upset that he said like you know son if you're such a smart ass then why don't you start your firm? And obviously, you didn't expect what I was saying. We said, cool, that's a really great idea. I want to start a tech firm. And that was like in the dot-com time. So I started like a first web development agency. And uh, that's how I got really into entrepreneurship. And like since then, I always enjoyed like building like different companies. Of course, the first company which we built uh, then like was in the dot-com times failed miserably. So I'm not going to talk a lot about that. But I had a, I had a good experience there. And then basically, Scobbler was the second company that we built out of the learning from a failed dot-com company. And that's when I want to start a little bit the story. So I think when we started Scobbler, basically we had like a very, very basic vision, which again, talk about it very stupid because it just like doesn't make any sense anymore. But back then, basically we had the analysis. We knew that we were looking like for a big market that looks for disruption. So we were looking at like navigation because that was like something which we knew that like everybody's going to need, right? I mean, it's just a, such an obvious need that people need to get from A to B and they have no idea where to get to. And we looked at the market and back then the market had like two stages. So this was, you have to imagine this was like 10 years ago. So this was like around the time um, when the first iPhone was like introduced and there was the embedded navigation market. So people would buy like a navigation system for their cars. And that was like typically around that time anywhere from like 1,000 to 3,000 euros if you have the navigation in your car. And like back at the day, like originally when that came up in the 90s, about two to five percent of the people afforded that. So this was really like a very luxurious thing which you would like put into your like Mercedes or your high-end car. Um, but that was like the, basically like the start of it. And then like around like the 2000s, basically portable navigation systems came. So they were like 100 to 300 euros roughly. And then you saw that adoption got like to like up to 30 percent of the people had that in their cars. So you see like basically what they did is by lowering the by 10x, they managed to um, take adoption up by a factor of 10x as well, likewise. So and like, this was like basically the, the, the idea when we started Scobbly, we were like looking at like, okay, what do you need to do to take adoption to 100%? How can you get like everybody navigation? Because we knew like from a lot of kind of discussions that basically everybody, everybody wants to have that. And basically, so our hypothesis back then, which obviously now was not thinking far enough as you, as you obviously know, is like we're thinking like, okay, if we take it like to somewhere 10 euros maybe, then you can get it like to 100% adoption because like almost everybody was willing to pay for that. And that was the basic hypothesis behind the, behind the company is like, how can we build a navigation system for 10 euros? And then again, obviously the answer was you cannot build hardware for 10 euros. So it has to be software, um, which again, like now with the app store and everything like that sounds super obvious, but you have to build this. We built the first version, not on an iPhone, but like on a Symbian phone where, I mean, each of you has like ever installed software on a Symbian phone, that, that is a real, real challenge. So I think this is like requires you like almost to have an advanced computer engineering degree to get like an app installed on a Symbian phone back then. Um, and like in the early versions, even you didn't even have GPS in there, right? So you would like need to install an app and you need to connect like an external GPS receiver that you put somewhere in your car. Um, but I think this is like kind of what we've like seen as the, as a big vision when we like built the company and saying like, okay, how can we build 
um, how can we build like an affordable navigation system? This was like kind of like the rough idea. And I think this is like also one of the lessons that I've personally learned all over the time is that like when you like build something is like if you build like, I mean, one thing that I've seen that works in generally pretty well, if you take something that like you I need and you you make it like 10x better, not like 5% or 10% better, but you can make it 10x better. Then we figured out like even the beginning when we build it, like even it had a lot of disadvantages, right? Like even it was like in a lot of ways, this was not as precise like these in-car navigation systems were like super precise. They work in tunnels. Your phone loses reception immediately if you go in a tunnel. And it has a lot of problems that you even nowadays have. But like if you make something that's like 10x cheaper or like 10x better in any other dimension, that works really, really well. So this was basically the, the idea that we... Um, that we that we started on um, and then also like I mean we went like the typical like startup journey and like pitched this idea to a lot of like competitions and so on so this went really 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 well so we were like timing wise we were like super lucky because this was again like around the time of the introduction of the of the iPhone and as you might know the first iPhone didn't have a GPS so with this one it didn't work so we were like still mostly like on on um, on Symbian phones but that went really really well so we won like um, the LBS competition from from, from Navtech, from one of the big players there, and really like got some funding to to um, to, to build the whole product. Um, and then I think we're like uh, we're like super lucky to be around at the time when the when the iPhone was there, and we launched uh, in 2009 in the App Store, and we became like immediately the number one sold app across like all categories because I think we were like very very early in the market so we were like in germany there was like only one big navigation which was before us which was like navigon and they like went the past to go more traditional right so you can like see they were like pricing their app at like 100 euros because they were pricing it more like a traditional navigation system and we were like entering the market actually like at five euros so and this is like what we've seen like within the first week we made like a hundred thousand euros revenue which was i mean for a small startup that we were back then was really quite phenomenal and we were like super lucky and like super excited and um, we're like thinking okay this is like going to be like the the hottest shit on the world and so on so we're like number one and like this is like really really great um, and so we had like really a good initial start but then of course also the trouble starts so I think this is like what one thing that I've also learned continuously so one of the things is that we got like sued for like patent infringement stuff like that so of course, like because the other app like lost at the moment that we launched, but we disrupted the market. They went like from 100 euros to like five euros. They lost like 70, 80 percent of their sales. So you can imagine that they were not very keen on that. Um, and um, so we bought actually originally the IP from 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 Navigon, uh, took that over into our stuff, and then we got like into a big lawsuit. And then we we're like saying like, oh shit, now this is like really big trouble because the startup, of course, like a million euros is a lot of money. And what the guys did also, which was very special, so they sent like the lawsuit, for example, at my parents' home address, which you can imagine that how happy my parents are if I didn't get a serious job, but I get sued for a million euros. And they said like, son, you should like work for like Siemens or some shit like that and not um, like get sued by Navigon for like patent infringement. My mother does not, does not understand anything what's in the lawsuit. It's just like a million euros and obviously this must have done something wrong or so on because like nobody sues you just like for the purpose of it. We won the lawsuit later anyway. And the really cool thing is actually the lawsuit was one of the best things that ever happened to us because we used this in the classical PR way like David versus Goliath. This big like corporate navigation giants are suing the small startup which tries to like democratize navigation, make it available for everybody for free. So we got like all kinds of press everywhere for free. So actually our downloads went up like by a fact like two or three X. So I think like one of the best PR advisors is sued by somebody big and evil. Um, so I think like anybody who is now picking a lawsuit up from Facebook or so on might be having like a good shot at like getting their startup really well known and get a lot of users. Um, so again, so this was like really good. So while this was like very, very critical in the beginning and like you're thinking like, oh shit, like now everything is going and like the point is not they sued only the company, but they sued also us as founders personally. So it's not a very pleasant thing if you have like in your name a lawsuit of a million euros and you think you'll be like bankrupt or something like that. Um, but this was at the end very good. And then I think the second part came, right? So I think one thing that, that I said, like, right, it worked really, really well in Germany and we like had like really good success on the market, but obviously we didn't think far enough because the same logic which I shared that we want to be 10 times cheaper, obviously Google took it to the next level because as you might know, like for the first time when the iPhone was around, there was no Apple Maps on it, there was no Google Maps with navigation and so on. So all of this stuff came substantially later, but they then thought, of course, that like maybe not five euros is a great price, but maybe free is a great price, which is like really like, I mean, nothing beats free, right? I mean, we know all of that, that you'd like take it like to a totally different level. And 
um, it's very easy to like if you're a Google and you can afford like there at that time they were pulling in like anywhere from like 200 to 500 million dollars a year in their maps division right they're still right now they're still losing a huge amount of money with that but it's very hard as a startup to compete with that and I think this is also like one of the other lessons I learned so at that time when this happened we were also in the US market so we had like in Europe we were always charging because we know that like Germans like to pay so it's okay but we were like in the US market we were offering our product also for free and this was like the time when again our company was quite profitable so we're making like a few hundred thousand a month in profit and like we were like in the US we were like offering it for free but then we were like okay well this is a model that works really well and in the US at that time we were like in the app store like slightly ahead of ways so we were like really like battling with them but we said like we didn't want to take a lot of funding so as a company at the time that we sold it like still 70% of the company was more than 70% was owned by the founders so we didn't want to like run this as a traditional venture back company and raise a lot of money but we really wanted to build it like in a cash flow positive manner and that's why we like went in the US and it was one of the biggest mistakes that we made that we were not aggressive enough right so we we're like slightly ahead of ways we think okay we can make more money if we take it out of free and if we charge like a few dollars for it and it made us some revenue in the beginning but of course like you know that like at the end we sold like for 24 million and we sold for a billion so i mean you know the outcome out of that that was like really the most like expensive mistake to not just keep free and like push hard for it and really go very very aggressive so i think this is one of the um one of the lessons that i learned that i've seen like when you like i mean it's great if you're the disruptor it's not so great if you're the disruptor so i think like always like what i learned is like Think about this kind of like 10x innovation, but think about it as like who's the next guy who's going to disrupt you? How can you be more aggressive? How can you get one step further? How can you go from like, as I said, in our case, how could we have gone from five euros to free? How could we have like gone like, or like maybe, I don't know if this is possible, but now you can say like, can you go even further than that? Can you pay the user to use it, right? I mean, this is like, no, I mean, this is like, right? This sounds absurd, but why not? Why can you not say like you put advertisement in there and you split part of the revenue with users, right? I mean, there's like companies who are doing that, right? I mean, there's like payback systems and so on. Saying that this would have been a model which would have been there, but this is just like as a general advice that I want to share from like what, what we've learned is always have in mind what happens when, uh, when you possibly get disrupted. So what we did then is, um, because like the consumer market got really, really tough with like everybody like putting their stuff in for free. Um, but we also were lucky that we have built like quite a technology around like navigation. And um, we had like a couple of differentiators. So the two big differentiators which we built is one is our system worked completely offline. So this was still in Europe back then when you had like roaming fees was like really important. So if you did a navigation from Berlin to Paris back then, the roaming fees could, like if you do an online navigation with Google Maps, could have cost you like 200 euros in roaming fees, right? So like even if Google doesn't charge you, the operator would have might have charged you like 20 euros a megabyte. Now this is all gone with the regulations, but back then this was still a thing. So this was like one big differentiator that we had that it works fully, fully offline. And then we had like one feature which like Google Maps to this day doesn't have, which we're still making, even nowadays, we're still making like almost a million euros a year revenue with this, which is a speed cam warner that um, basically warns you like of police speed traps, which is like where people are willing to pay. So even people now pay like $10, a, 10 euros a year uh, to be warned from police cars. So this is still a good feature that Google for legal reasons doesn't want to do probably, I don't know. Um, but this was like two things where the automotive industry came to us and said like, hey guys, you've built like this great technology, can we like license it? So we were shifted from like a really consumer focused company to be B2B company. We got like, I don't know, like Bosch, PSA, like a couple of, couple of companies as, as customers and really build like focus really on this like cash flow track. So we went from being a very consumer focused company to a B2B technology licensing company, stabilized the company um, because like in the, like, I mean, when the moment when like Google came, like our revenue also dropped like, like crazy, right? So we still like got some money from the, from the offline navigation, but like our revenue dropped like 70, 80%. Um, which we luckily were able to partially compensate with the B2B, but that was like really for us the point where we said like, okay, the company is stable, the company is break even. Um, but then we were like thinking, okay, like how can you like take it to the next level again? Um, and that's basically then when we like as a founder said like, okay, so do we like want to, now have we like stabilized the company, do we now really want to expand and do we now want to take it very aggressive? Um, but then we've like decided to sell the company and um, that's basically then now, four years ago, when we, when we sold the company to Telenav, so Telenav is one of the big navigation providers in automotive. So they're providing the navigation for Ford, General Motors, 
few other big companies, so they provide that. And they were the original inventors of GPS navigation on the smartphone. There are a couple of Stanford guys who basically like 15 years ago, or like 20 years ago now, 15 years ago when we sold, invented like smartphone navigation DS and uh, took the company public and um, acquired our company. Um, and that's where, where I'm now joining. And so this is now the second part of my journey. So of course I said like, since I've been like an entrepreneur most of my life, I said like, okay, we signed on for like two years. And I said like, okay, I'll do like two years there. I'll hand them over the team and then I'll start, I'll start something new. And like we, we did this like, like two years and then after two years I said, guys, I'm done, I'm out of here. And they said like, well, um, our CTO wants to retire and um, he doesn't want to work anymore. Do you want to do the job? Do you want to come here like to Silicon Valley and like run the whole engineering group? Um, and yeah, but then I said like, okay, well that's, that's like, I mean, a very, very interesting challenge because I wanted to figure out anyway. So like after being like in Europe for quite a while, how it is to be um, in the US. So I think back then we had like built our Europe team out. So it was like, at, that, at the time when we sold, we were like a hundred people in Europe. So mostly we had our engineering team in Romania, but we had like our headquarter here in Berlin. And so I was splitting my time kind of between Berlin and Romania. And then now since about two years ago, I moved over um, to Silicon Valley, and that's when, like, I think the um, the next part of the of the journey. And I think this is like one uh, thing, but I want to like start talking a little bit about like some of the like big trends and stuff like that we're working on. But then also like talk a little bit more about the general trends that 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 I'm seeing. So I think for me the really interesting opportunity was like now my team that I have my engineering group, which I'm leading, is like split like about one third is in Silicon Valley, one third is in Europe, and one third is in China. So I was like last week in China, I'll be like, I was this week in Europe and next week I'll be uh, or from tomorrow and I'll be back in Silicon Valley. So it's like really, really interesting for me to see the different kind of perspectives and trends on that. And I think one thing that, um, that I'm going to talk about a little bit is like how this is applied in the things for developing of like self-driving cars and so on, like how these like kind of big trends happen and how you can like kind of spot this. Because this is like very similar on the theme which I said like earlier with this like 10x innovations. One of the themes that's very, very common is like Moore's law is like powering a lot of the startups, right? Like in different factions and like there's different kinds of variations of this law or so on. But then one thing that I got really excited about also our industry, the navigation system is something that's been solved, right? So I think like navigation system are like better or worse or so on, but this is not really the interesting stuff. But like self-driving cars was very clear that it's going to happen very soon. And I think it's going to happen even with all the, the uber craziness that we have is happening much, much sooner than people in general. There's like one big trend that is powering that. And I think this is like one of the most powerful charts that's probably going to define the next decade in like technology, which is like the advances of AI. And what you can see, this is like a, um, this is like an AI competition where basically this is like about image recognition. So where basically you see an image and you just say, is it a cat? Is it a dog? Whatever. And Basically, this is like the error rate that you have. So like how many like how many errors you make like for a hundred pictures that you look at and like to classify it. And what you can see is that like AI, even like back in 2010, was like had like a huge error rate, like 30% error rate. Like a human has about 5% error rate, which I'm a little bit surprised that humans can't classify this object that well apparently, but this is like um, like the, the reality. And like humans in the last 10 years unfortunately didn't get better. So like humans in 10, 2010 and humans in 2016 are still like same error exponential improvement at all. Um, but the algorithms have about an improvement about their doubling, their doubling in capacity every year roughly, right? Because you've seen like in the last few years, like computers or so on didn't get that much faster anymore. But especially in the domain of AI, you can see that they've taken it like from 30% to like 3% in a, in a span of like six years. And now they're like at like 1% to or something like that, the best algorithms. And this means, like, what you've seen is, is, is two things. You see, A, that in a lot of areas, you have basically these AI algorithms that have, like, superhuman capabilities. So if you look at, like, things like computer vision, it's now in a lot of cases, like, better than if you would make a human see this kind of stuff. If you do stuff like sign recognition, which is, like, the heart of a self-driving car, um, then it is now better capabilities than, than a human has, right? I mean, if you have good AI, like Uber should probably like take some one of the better algorithms. But um, I mean, ultimately, this is really like at a level that it's a, it's already better, but b, it's also improving very, very fast. And if it continues to improve at that exponential rate, then you can imagine like in four years, it's going to be more than ten times faster. So anything that you have now, if you look at 2022, it's going to be like ten times better than now. So it's like 
it's very hard like in general because as humans our brain is wired to think like linearly I think like it gets like better like a few points like every year but I think if it's like within three four years you're talking about a 10x improvement then totally new things will be there and you see this also like in, in self-driving cars so right now if you look at the best self-driving car out there which is without a doubt the car that like Waymo that Google produces right now because like in California if you have like your self-driving car and then you need to like release like what is called a disengagement report. So anytime when like the human safety driver needs to take over, you need to file a report and you need to like uh, publicize the statistics. So you know that we know that like, and now Google released the new data. So it actually went down by another 4X. But back then this was like basically they have 0.2 disengagements per 1,000 miles. And if you look at that, like now Google is at 0.05 about. So if you look at the human, and then you know that only like one in 10 disengagements would have resulted in the crash. Oftentimes like humans take over because like they don't know what happens and so on, and then they analyze it. So roughly you could say like one in 10 disengagements results in a crash. So right now, like if you take the current data, then right now a self-driving car is about at like 0 0.01 crashes per thousand miles and like humans have like 0 0.006 crashes per thousand miles. So you now see that they're very, very similar. So right now, even I mean, and of course, we had, I don't have access to Waymo's internal data, but even at the public data, you can see that the crash rate is still the, about the same, which means like we're not quite there yet because I mean, probably would not accept that self-driving cars kill as many people as human do, right? I think this would be probably like ethically not acceptable. But if you combine it with what I said earlier about like an exponential improvement, then you already know in three, four years, it'll be like at least 10x better, maybe, maybe more, right? Like, I mean, the internal stuff that they might have might already by now by a factor of like three, four better than the stuff which they test in beta systems. So they might be already ahead now. Um, it's very, very hard to tell. Um, but I think this is kind of like the, like one of the other kind of things that I've seen, like when you like want to build a startup, build it around like some exponential function, because this is like when you can build stuff that is not possible now, and you see, build it like three years in the future, that's there, right? Because the same thing as when we looked at it, like when we started building Scobler, there were no phones which had like GPS, there was no phones which had the power to run apps that were like easy to install, all of that stuff was not there. But you could like clearly see like from the exponential improvement and so on that phone technology you would have at that time, you need to start building it now that you have it ready in a year or two, when the product is there, otherwise you miss the market, right? So I think when you now want to build a self-driving car, you need to start building it now, or probably you need to start building it a few years back that by the time that the technology is like ripe, you have something that you can put to market. I think that was like um, one, one more learning that I had. Yeah, this is like, um, this is interesting. So this is like the video of like our self-driving car that we've, that we've built. Um, and um, so because we wanted to really learn about this. And the kind of thing is like, so we've built a self-driving car that drives itself at the highway. And we've built it like with a team of like, uh, with like less than, um, with like less than five people, we've built like a basic self-driving car. Again, it doesn't like work everywhere and so on. So for us, the purpose is more to learn about the technology than to build like a full self-driving car. But the kind of thing is that like right now, AI technology is like so advanced that with like five people, you can like build a self-driving car. This is like a decade ago or two decades ago, you would have needed a team like from hundreds of engineers, right? So I think this is like, I mean, I've driven a couple of times with it. And, and I think this is like really just amazing what, what you can build with a small engineering group based on this kind of exponential improvement. So I would like bet that like probably in 10, 15 years from now, like high school classes are going to build this shit as a graduation project or so on. Because technology is improving so much in this area that it's just going to be much, much easier. So maybe they shouldn't put it on the road, but I think that's a separate part of the discussion. So. Um, what, what are we doing now with this, right? Because as I said, like our goal is not to, not to build self-driving cars. So what we're doing now with this is we're building technology to basically build the maps for these self-driving cars. So one thing that we learned is that like all of the self-driving cars are going to need maps for orientation that they know where to go, which are updated every minute. And that means like the traditional model for map making was that you send like a million dollar car with a lot of sensors once a year across all the road, you've seen like these Google Street View cars, you've seen like cars from, from other companies doing that. And like typically they send them like once a year with all the sensors to all the roads, they like cartograph everything, update it, um, and then publish this data. But the problem is about 10 to 15% of the road network changes on a yearly basis. So this means even like in a really good navigation system, 10 to 15% of the information you have wrong, which is okay if it's used for a navigation system, but if you use it for a safety critical system like a self-driving car, it's not okay to have 10 to 15% wrong. So this is kind of the thing where we said like, okay, 
in the future the cars needs to be the sensor so basically the car needs to see the world and like everything that it sees shares immediately with the with the with the crowd of all the other cars so basically this is what what we're doing so we're using like basically the the vision technology in the cars process all the information in the cars and make it immediately available to all the other cars so you can imagine like this right if one car sees an accident then it can react to that obviously in real time but it's much safer for the car behind it when it knows that there's an accident coming up and then it can react to it before it gets there. So that's kind of like the, the, the idea. So what we do is basically we take data from cars, GPS probes, imagery, process this on the car, send this to the cloud, send it out to all the other, send it to all the other vehicles and do that. So I'm going to share a little bit like how this looks like. So this is basically like you can imagine, right? Like when the cars are driving and you see like, okay, there's like, this is the road network and then you see some people driving on this road and when we like have enough people driving there, then our like AI algorithms automatically say, okay, there must be obviously a road there. We add it to the road network and then like after like a few minutes, like all the other cars can go there as well. So this is like a very, very simple example of, um, of something like this. Or you can see basically how the this is kind of like, an, like an, a phone app which we built. So we built this also in a very hackish manner that we don't want to wait until the car's on the road. So you have built like a setup where you put like a smartphone there, it records while you're driving, and then you can like see it processes the lanes and so on. So you can see that like in real time, it basically processes all this information, how many lanes it has, where there are signs and so on. Like, and the, the dots that you see are used like for orientation that it can like position itself in space because GPS is not active, uh, accurate enough. And then basically it gets uploaded to the server where we can then basically create the maps and send them to all the other vehicles. So this is like the, the main purpose why I'm kind of showing this is because I think I'm so amazed by what this kind of like AI technology can do now and like how you can build stuff that like years ago you would have needed teams of like hundreds of engineers and now you can build this all with like with, with reasonable sized teams. So this is like basically where it gets aggregated from all the cars. So like this is like where a sign is. So like each car sends like, hey, I detect a sign here or so on. And then it gets like aggregated and like put into the map. And that's like kind of where you see a lot of change. And I think this is like one thing that I see also like as a general, like for people who are in engineering, one thing that I was most fascinated is like how different AI teams are structured. So if you look in our AI team or AI teams that companies like Facebook or Google or so on have is they're very different from an engineering team normally. Like a product engineering team normally is, let's say, you have a group, and depending on how big the group is, but you might have like maybe five engineers, two quality assurance people, maybe a project manager, a product manager, UX guy. So that's your typical team. On an AI group, the thing is there's like maybe like two engineers, but there's like 20 data entry people. So because like a lot of this AI stuff is like really training the system. Because actually like the difference is, in the past you used to code the system, right? You create a rule, you have like somebody thinking about, like you have like this, most of the program is like kind of this if then else kind of statements to think like, okay, if you teach a self-driving car, if you see a car in front of you, then brake, right? So I think this is like traditional programming. AI is more like you like have somebody drive the car and create a test case and it learns if I see another car in front of me, then I brake, right? So you don't really tell the car explicitly anymore, but you teach it basically. And so basically the biggest roles in these kind of AI teams is really people teaching the algorithms, right? So we have like, we have like a lot of people which are doing nothing else than like basically looking at the images, marking them, this is this sign, this is that. And this is, we have like in our group, we have more than 25 people doing nothing else than entering the data and just like maybe five engineers who are like really processing the algorithms. So I think that's like one of the, one of the big things that I've learned. Um, and then I want to share also one thing. So especially in Germany, of course, we are very technology skeptical. I think like here in the German Tech Entrepreneurship Center, it's probably more like advanced. But I think in Germany, there's always like a lot of like, ooh, technology is going to kill off all of us and all these like AI overlords are coming. Um, and I wanted to share like a little story about that because I looked at like the introduction of another like self-driving vehicle. So funny thing is also in Germany about 100 years ago, when you wanted to ride an elevator, you needed to have a driver's license, right? Sound reasonable? No, probably not, but it's actually true, right? So in Germany, there was like a German official elevator operator license. Why is this? Well, because like elevators back then, you needed to pull a lever and you could really like hurt yourself because this thing had no safety protection. You could drive it into the roof because it wouldn't have like an automatic stop. You could like stop between floors because it didn't have like a button which you push like third floor or so on. And if you read the stories, when they introduced the first self-driving elevators, people got really scared 
So like, and like the good thing is like laziness took over. So there's like stories of people who are like making a rational decision saying like, I'll take the elevator up to the fifth floor because I'm too lazy to walk, but I'm walking down because it's too dangerous for me to be in this like elevator. So I think this is like, and you can like read a lot of these stories that people are like really, really afraid of these kind of like elevators and they needed to invent like all kinds of devices. So they had like this, they need to have like this kind of recordings that they have like a voice in there saying like, okay, like now you're like at the third floor because the beginning elevators had this operator, right? Like they had this lift boy who was like in there and operating the elevator for you. And this was like hugely expensive, of course. If you have like one human in every lift that's nothing else doing than driving you up and down. Uh, and this is like the same thing which you have in Uber, right? Like you have like in Uber you have in front now, you have like the equivalent of a lift boy that's driving you around. Um, and like if you can eliminate him like the lift boy, then you of course unlock like a whole different Part of part of this, right? So I think one thing is like when, when what I'm always sharing, and people think about the fear of going into a self-driving car. I think this kind of stuff often gets overcome very, very fast. And when the paradigm shift, after a while, it's going to be like so ridiculous. I say, for example, whenever I get kids, I don't think by the time that they reach driving age, it will be legal to drive anymore, right? I think the same way that it's totally absurd now that you have like a, somebody driving the elevator for you. I think it'll be very absurd um, for people like driving a car. So I think this is like very roughly what I think is going to happen, right? So you see like this year you see like first initial deployments. I mean, Google is already doing this, Like right? Google has already self-driving cars in operations. And if you're right now in San Francisco at any like city corner, I think you can sit at any street corner. If you sit like where, where I live in San Francisco, I guarantee you in a cafe within a time span of like one hour, you see at least like 10, 20 self-driving cars passing you. So in San Francisco, I think there's now a fleet of more than 200 cars operating. So you already see that that's happening. And by 2020, you'll be probably like in life in 100 plus cities, uh, most likely none of them in Germany, but let's see. Um, but definitely like US, definitely United Arab Emirates, Dubai, uh, definitely Singapore, definitely China. So I think a lot of these markets are very, very aggressive. Um, and then about like, I would say in the latest stage, like probably 2025, you see the first city that will ban non-self-driving cars. So I think this is a very bold prediction. So we'll see if that's gonna happen. Um, but I, I think like it's going to be based on this like exponential change. It's going to be really, really quick. Anyway, so I think that's like quickly what I wanted to share. And then I wanted to share a little bit what is kind of things that I learned from being in Silicon Valley, like the difference when coming from like Berlin and like also like, I mean, in, in between. So I think one of the number one things that I learned is that think about like 10 X improvements. But right? it's extremely like, especially if you want to do a product that requires people to shift their habits or so on then you need to think about like a 10x improvement on that order of magnitude, right? Like 5x, 15x, something like that, because it's very, very hard to shift people's habits. And like if you like accomplish this 10x, then you can do something that's really, really big and that's bold, right? And that's one thing that's like continuously driving like Silicon Valley. I mean, most of the Silicon Valley success stories are not like I'm trying to make something like 3% better, right? So I don't really know any Silicon Valley success story that started like this. So I think if you can like invent an iPhone from this one, which is not exactly fair comparison. Symbian was a little bit better than that, but not much. Um, but then it's like where you have really something, some magic created, right? And that's like, I think if you have that mindset, if you really think about that, then that's, um, then that's like really the point. And I think I love the story that Elon Musk tells about this, right? He has this whole concept, which he calls like fundamental reasoning. It's when you think about like how he invented like SpaceX, right? So he like did the same thing. Like NASA was, I think, space agencies where it continues like improving three, 5%. But Elon Musk was like looking at it like a child. He was looking like, okay, why is like a rocket so damn expensive, right? What's the problem with a rocket, right? Like a rocket shouldn't be expensive, right? So, because now I was thinking the rocket price is like X billion dollars and we can make it 5% better. And that was the only thing that they have in their mind. And Elon Musk was looking at it from another perspective. He's saying like, well, a rocket is like basically two things. It's like a piece of metal and it's a couple of cash. And none of these components are very expensive. And it's like, why is the problem? Why is it so expensive? And anybody has a guess? Why is a rocket expensive? Exactly. That's exactly the problem. Imagine how expensive it would be consistent to Berlin if you would after that crash and burn the plane. Like a plane ticket would cost you like a million dollars. Nobody would fly. It would just like explode the plane afterwards. It's like just absurd. So this is exactly what he like kind of looked at it. She said like, how can I make it like 10x better and not like 5% or 10%? It's like by the concept of like fundamental reasoning, by looking at some, the problem again and not looking it through the lens through the existing solution, but look at it from the, from the new solution. And that's how you get like 10x thinking. And then there's the second thing, which I find very, very fascinating. So this is this thing 
which is the OODA loop, which is uh, OODA stands for observe, orient, decide, and act. So this is like based on a study on successful World War II fighter pilots. And basically they, they studied like all these fighter pilots and they tried to see like what's the, what's the success criteria for, for a fighter pilot which survives and one that dies. And the success criteria is not like, it's not intelligence, it's not reaction speed, it's not like physical fitness, it's none of that. But the key factor is basically this loop that you're going through, how fast you can process this loop. And this loop is like an agile, I would say it's like an agile iteration basically. And this is like the key success factor for a fighter pilot and I think this is also the key success factor for a startup. Because what does this mean? Like a complete OODA loop means like, of course it doesn't mean that you just decide every three seconds something else. That's not what it means. But it means basically you observe what's happening. You take like in like everything that's happening on the market. You orient yourself. Then you're like, okay, this is like what, what we're going to do. You decide based on all the information. You act and then you measure again, right? So basically this is like, I mean, this kind of iteration, right? That's what like, I mean, what all the tech startups now are really, really famous for that they Basically, like the difference is like if you look at like the Silicon Valley car industry versus the German car industry. The German car industry, we have like a, a planning room where they plan now the cars for 2025. So I'm now, since I'm in the automotive industry, it drives me nuts. We have now projects which they're discussing as uh, features that we're launching in 2023 in the market, right? And we're discussing this now. I mean, it's like makes no sense. What do I know what's going to happen in 2023, right? And this is like a huge, huge problem. And then other companies, they're discussing what they build in the next six weeks and then they iterate on that. By 2023, they have like a hundred iterations. And then it's like just a question, who do you think is going to win? The person who's now trying to plan 2023 or the person who has like a hundred iterations by that and has like learned and improved a lot. And I think this is like one of the key things that a lot of, a lot of people like in the more like traditional industries, they don't understand that like oftentimes it's very, very, I mean, there's a saying, right? It's very hard to predict the future. It's much easier to build it. And I think this is like kind of the whole kind of saying around this like OODA loop and again there's also this and then I think one thing is also it's very important if you're a startup to have like some sort of an unfair advantage have something that differentiates you from other people so for example what we had as an unfair advantage at Scobbler is we had like we had a German company the German reputation but we had our engineering team in Romania which again nowadays it's not at that level anymore but back then it was about three four times cheaper than Berlin so you could just hire way more engineers and so on at a good cost level than, than others could. And this was allowing us to really like scale a profitable company because if we would have been in Silicon Valley, then it would have been way more expensive. We would have never built a profitable company. And again, it had also like some disadvantage, but this was something that we could really leverage. And I think this is like what I've seen with almost like every company, they have like at least one of these kind of things, which is very, very defensible, unique, unfair advantage that you can, that you can do. Then one more thing which I learned in Silicon Valley is the work ethics in Silicon Valley is brutal. And this is, I mean, people basically, most people, right? I mean, you talk always, like you often talk about the Zuckerbergs and so on. I don't think what Silicon Valley sets apart is that they have brilliant people. I don't know, think that Zuckerberg is smarter than the, like, the top guy that, that would be like here or so. And I think this is totally not the difference. But the, the, the point is in Silicon Valley, there's a lot of people who are basically looking for a startup that's just right to take off and they're taking the calculated bet. If I'm going to make like $10 million, I'm willing to sacrifice the next five years of my life. And when I'm talking about this, I really mean it. I really mean they're working like 16, 18 hours a day, six, seven days a week, doesn't matter. And this is like just a lot of this like kind of grit gets there. This is like the, it's not like Zuckerberg or something, but that's like the hundred people below. And if you look like a company like Google or Facebook, they create like a hundred or a thousand millionaires. They go public. And this is like, I think what, what is one thing that, that I learned is like in Silicon Valley, like almost any company, like even like a Telenet or something, like you would get like for everybody in Silicon Valley, 30% of the salaries in stock. Like either if you're a non-public company, like stock options or so on, like, or like stock in the non-public company, if it's a public company, stocks and so on. So I think this is like, everybody is like extremely incentivized to make a company go. Nobody works there in salary. In Silicon Valley, the reality is like from the salary, you probably cannot even pay your rent. So I think if, you're, if your startup doesn't go well, then you're kind of screwed. You might not be able to send your kids to school. So crazily expensive. The pressure is so high that basically like everybody needs to work for this. So this is like, I think one of the things that, that I've learned, and I think again, I don't, I don't like think the extremes that it's in Silicon Valley is good. This has gone way out of hand. It causes a lot of problems as well. But I think like if you think about that, you want to have people, not only the founder of the company, but like every of the employee go like really 100% in. And I think this is one thing 
that uh, that you need to like look at. Like, how can you make sure that everybody is really aligned? Can you create a winning team and not like a few founders and a few employees? So I think that's one thing that I've that I've seen. Um, and then I think there's like a, another point, right? So I think learning, like even if you do what I said, like a quick iteration with the OODA loop and stuff like that, um, I think learning still takes time. So one thing is, which works extremely well in Silicon Valley, and I think you can also do here, and I see more and more companies also do, is like take people who have done it before. I think this is like just so, so important that like when you look at like, why is like Facebook able to grow so quick? Well, a lot of the early Facebook guys are like Google guys, Apple guys, right? So these people, they like, when they see another company who's like about to go off, then they come over and they have like done it before. And this is of course like a total different thing. If you have like a few people that scale the company to like a billion users, it's like, of course you can learn it, right? You can take a few smart guys from universities that need to figure all of this shit out. But like if somebody said like, yeah, I'll build like a server that scaled to a billion users before, it's way easier for them. And I think this is like the ability of the, have like this talent that's already done it and that's willing to jump ship for a really good incentive. I think these are the two kind of things which you see for explosive growth because basically with that you can like really rocket fuel growth because these people are willing to give like everything, 150%. And they have like done it at other places. They go continuously around, right? I think now a lot of these people like went like, I mean, it's like really this kind of like train where they go from one fast growing company to the other and always the best people, they go always to the next and to the next and to the next. And this is again, why I don't think really it's about the founders, it's not Zuckerberg's, but it's about this next level of people who really build this kind of stuff. And I think this is really a thing that I'm hoping that we're, that we're seeing more and more here. So I think with that, I'm at the end, so I think I hope, um, I mean, I really like what like Steve Jobs said there, if you're going to build something, then at least like try to put a dent in the universe because I mean, otherwise we're wasting all of our time. So I hope we can like do this and I'm hopefully like in a few years back in Berlin and like trying the next iteration and like applying all of this. Thank you very much. So we're as a, I mean, we're as a company, we're supplying navigation systems like to Ford, GM, which is two out of the five biggest car manufacturers in the world. So luckily we have already like data from like millions of vehicles, um, but that, that's, that's absolutely right. But I mean, you need to get in there and like getting these kind of automotive contracts is, uh, is very time consuming. And the very, I mean, the automotive industry is still not the fastest moving industry in the world, but we are like, as a company, we're lucky that we have access to this because we serve them already for like, many, many years. No, so this is all one thing that I also learned. Since Telenov is a public company and I'm an officer of the company, if I tell that I'll go to jail and I really don't want to go to jail. So I cannot share any like information that we haven't publicly disclosed before. Because even if Silicon Valley is nice, I don't want to go into jail there. So <laughs> that was the first thing that I got. Like when I went to the yes, the first thing I got like a very extensive training from our legal team, what not to say in public, especially if it's recorded. But it's millions, so that's what I can say. So this is what we said. Okay, any other questions? Um, it's, it's a very interesting question. I'm not sure if I have a really good answer to that. But I think like the, the structure that Google has created, I think it's a very interesting solution to the problem, right? So like Google had exactly the problem that they didn't manage to innovate because everybody was so cozy and comfortable. And what they did basically, they broke the company down, right? They created a holding company, Alphabet, and made like Google one company, but then they created other companies. So for example, their self-driving division, Waymo, is now a standalone company. And so I think a lot of times when you create a structure that takes people out of corporate hierarchies, and like lets them do stuff, I think you have a much higher chance to innovate, right? Like if all of what you're concerned is like fi filing a travel report and getting your expenses paid back, the chances that you're going to innovate is unfortunately pretty low. So I think like uh, as a corporation, what you need to do is 
a couple of these things that I said here, right? You need to create a more startup-like structure to remove the people from the corporate overhead. I think ideally you create an incentive structure, right? Like Google did this also with Waymo. So a lot of the people who created the self-driving cars at Google, even if they were employees of the company, got like multi-million, multi-tens of million dollar bonuses, right? So a couple of these original Waymo guys make more than the CEO of Daimler Chrysler, right? I mean, like, I, I mean the, the, like Sebastian Trun who built it apparently made like a $50 million bonus. Like as a, being a company employee, he makes more than the highest paid duck CEO. So I think this is like a very startup mindset, right? If you know that if you're building something that creates like tens of billions for the company you're building it, and if you make like a really like a entrepreneur sized reward, then you're much more likely to do that. So I think like a structure and ideally like a reward system that aligns with that. And um, yeah, and I mean, probably you need to give people like the free, you need to give them like a CEO or so on that can like run this small division. And then like let them run and if they fail then shut it down but if it works then like do that so i think that's the best i can have as an answer but i have not i mean i've not solved it yet it's a very very hard problem Yes, no, I think this is like the, the user experience of a self-driving car is very, very critical. So I can tell you like for myself, like riding in a self-driving car, it is like if you don't know what the car thinks, it's very, very scary, right? So the problem is first of all, what you need to create in a self-driving car is a communication interface that you can look in the car's brain. So one thing is the first thing that you see in every self-driving car, is it shows you the surrounding in a visual way because you trust the computer if it shows, I mean, it has makes no difference on the self-driving car operation, but if it shows you, I see that you're here, I see there's a car on the right side of you, if you know that the computer sees this car on the right side of you, you have a certain belief that it's not going to crash into it, right? So I think this is like one of the, like one of the very simple things. So like have the computer communicate with a human being saying like, this is what I see. And like also have the human tell him what you're going to do. Like if the computer tells you, hey, I th see there's no car on the right side of you. In two seconds, I'm going to switch to the next lane to the right. And then he does this. Then you have like a certain belief that it's not going to do something bad. So I think this kind of like interface for communication between the car and the human is one of the very, very critical things that you build trust on, that you like communicate what you see, show him what you're doing, and this kind of thing. So I think that's like one of the things that there's a lot of research going on from like any company that does this because people get very, very, very scared. And I've experienced it myself. If you don't know what's happening, you don't feel very safe. But once the car communicates with you in a way, it gets much, much safer. There's many, many great things. So I think like, so to be, to be perfectly clear, I don't think that Silicon Valley is the future model. So I think there's many, many things wrong with Silicon Valley. And I think they can be like perfectly exploited. So one thing that's wrong with Silicon Valley cost. Average cost for an engineer, like fully loaded with like office and everything is about like $3,000 per person. So this is like in, in Berlin, you can easily get two people. So we're now like a low cost country in Germany in comparison. Right? So I think you can get really good engineers at really reasonable rates in Berlin. So I think that's one thing that I would say is like really good. Um, I think the second thing is uh, right now in Silicon Valley, as I said, like with the cost of living and so on, it's so high that a lot of the crazy ideas, they don't like the Silicon Valley, the garages are gone. I don't know a single person who started a company in a garage because most of my friends can't afford a garage. Right? My parking space in Silicon Valley costs $400 rent a month, just my freaking parking space. Like in Berlin, I can get like a single bedroom apartment maybe, like, or like a shared flat or something like that. So this is like, like in Silicon Valley, I can't park my car for that amount of money. Right? So I think this is kind of things, like if you want to create something where you don't know if it works and you want to like fiddle around it or so on, so you can do that in Berlin much better. That's why you see, for example, the blockchain space. A lot of the blockchain space got created in Europe because it was like, at least in the beginning, now people get like buy all these like crypto Lamborghinis or something like that. But like originally it was not like that, right? It was like idealists who like hacked on their spare time and didn't get like a $300,000 a year salary. So I think this is kind of stuff. If you want to build something that's out there and that requires like long iteration, in Berlin you can do it way, way easier than there. So I think that's, that's, that's another point. Um, I think also like the mix of the different things that you have. Berlin is way more diverse. It's like a city of the arts and like kind of different things. So I think like for some other companies that are not pure tech, I think in Silicon Valley you're in the bubble. You're like, like everybody around you is like a techie. 
so I think you think like technology is like everything. You like in Silicon Valley, the mindset is like, um, oh, there's a human doing that. Can I like rationalize the human out of that? It's like, oh, there's like, so this is very hard to like stay in touch with reality. If this is like everybody thinks like this, right? So I think this is like three things, and there's many, many more. But I'm not like I, I don't think like Berlin is like doom and gloom. So I, I think like. I think like disruption is very, very possible from here, but uh, I like, it's like, for me, it's great, right? I go there, I learn. So I, I see this years in Silicon Valley for me now as a free university. I want to learn there, take the best from there, and then go here and then disrupt it again, right? So that's kind of the mindset that I would have. And it sounds like the go deep or go bust is more, more like uh, your kind of mindset. Um, but what would you uh, think of like your father's approach of just going to the competition um, and um, no, I think I think it's 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 certainly it's possible, right? So, I mean, people have have done it. Yeah. So I think that's why. I mean, I think it, it, you're, you're right, but like, it wouldn't I wouldn't be excited about it. Um, because I mean, I don't mind failure, right? Like my first company like burned like two million euro and went bankrupt, and it was like it was okay, right? It was a great experience for me, and. And so I, do, I don't think like it's a problem. I don't think like it ruins you. So for me, it's like when you want to do something, then it's like better to like think bigger and try harder and see if it works or not. And then if it doesn't work, then try something else. So this like, it wouldn't be like my kind of thing, but there's nothing wrong with that, right? So you can like, and also what I say is not applicable to every industry, right? So I think if you build like an ad tech company, you can't build a 10x better solution that gets like a 10x higher click-through rate or something. It's just like fundamentally not possible. And a lot of highly efficient markets, like a 1% improvement might be fantastic if you achieve it, right? If you like build a solution that saves the German railroad company like 1% of their maintenance cost, that might be like tens of millions of dollars opportunity, right? So I think what I'm saying doesn't apply to everything, but it's especially about disruptive technologies, which is a field that I'm very excited about because I think, I think, I mean, one thing which is my biggest grief is that if you look at it like in, like there's like the only tech company in Germany which was ever like really at that scale created is like SAP and that's like 30 years ago and, and I mean, this is like, I mean, we should be better than that. So that's kind of like my take. So that we should create this big disruptive company. This is not a must. Um, I, mean, I think a lot of the things which I try to share there, like better incentive structures for the people, um, I think um, this, those kind of things, I think they would work equally well here. I don't think they are like particularly unique for Silicon Valley. So I really incentivize the teams really well so make everybody like push in the same direction. Part of that is already now adopted, right? Like now this is way more common than it was a few years. But I still hear like from startups right now where like maybe the top like the top five, ten people get like stock options and like everybody else in the startup doesn't. So I see this still in Berlin. So I think that's like the number one thing which I would make sure that like everybody is incentivized really well. So that I would adopt. Um, I think um, another thing is like really the, um, the kind of like willingness to go like above and beyond. Right? So people in Silicon Valley do have work life balance like in between, right? They push three years really hard and then they like take a year or two off, right? So it's not that they, it's not that these people for 20 years in a row work like 80, 90 hour work weeks. So I think you have, you do it in phases. So I think this is like one thing that like going like really and like pushing very hard, it just makes such a big difference. I think if, if, if you're pushing like 40 hours a week and the guy next to you pushes 100 hours a week, there's chances that they're going to win is just much bigger. So I think that's like the second thing that like sometimes people could be a little bit less relaxed. So um, this is very unpopular what I'm saying, but maybe like rising rent prices would help people to push harder here. Yes. Okay, okay. Like, 
that's why we're getting every cup of companies are better. And that's why also the Chinese companies are better. So what do you see that they see also from the extreme China? Um, so are we, are we just not going like too late to the big markets? I think a lot of it is a mindset also, right? Yeah. Like let's say in Germany, right? Like let's say you go to an event like this and somebody asks you what you're doing and you say like, I'm trying to build a billion dollar company and everybody's going to laugh at you. At least this is like my experience. It's like seen as a crazy thing. And like at Silicon Valley, I can go to an event, like 10 people are going to pitch me that they're building the next billion dollar company. So like, like this, right? So I had a chance to meet like a Sequoia partner, Michael Moritz a few weeks back. And I had a chance like to chat with him and I asked him, so okay, Michael, so what's like, what's like driving you? And say so like, well, my goal is I want to like, I want to find $100 billion company every decade, right? So it's, no, it's very hard. And in 99% of the companies that I invest, I fail, I've not achieved that. But I don't go into a company right now that would not have the potential to reach like a $100 billion valuation and change the world, right? And I think I would not know a single VC in Germany would say that, who would, they wouldn't put an insane asylum for saying that, right? So, but he can say something like that. And I think this is the, the difference in mindset when you can in an ecosystem safely say something like that without being considered insane that's a big difference and i see this in china too right so i was like last week again in china and like you see that like the people there are very aggressive i mean a lot of people there grew up like in rural villages and stuff like that and they now live in like shanghai with like all the coolest technology they have a total different mindset and, like here we often have the mindset that technology takes stuff away from us and it makes it worse there they've seen that it has like improved their life like radically and i think this is like kind of one thing that I think like, and I was also a bit back going to what, what you asked, if you have this mindset that like you can go big and that like you can improve people's lives and so on, it just gives you to a total different perspective than we always consider about the fears, right? So I think I'm very happy that nobody asked today about self-driving cars killing people, about data privacy issues, right? This is like often like the safety mindset that you have instead of the can-do attitude. So I'm super happy about that. Oh. <laughs> no, no, I mean, we have like 200 people in Europe and we have like customers in Europe, so we have to uh, operate in Europe as well. And uh, one law firm made a lot of money with us for the GDPR compliance. So I spent a lot of time again with lawyers and not building technology uh, and like learning about GDPR laws. So I'm very familiar with that actually. And like we deal with that in a couple of ways, right? Like we anonymize all the stuff, like all the license plate, all the people's faces and so on that get recognized, get like blurred out and so on. You need to ask the people, of course, consent when you collect all of this data. So it is, it, it makes it very complex, but it's, it's still very doable as long as you like respect people's privacy. And I think, by the way, this is also maybe a great opportunity. I think like people are fed up that their data is like stolen and used for all kinds of shit. Maybe that's one thing that can be built really cool out of Berlin because maybe we can use a privacy mindset as an advantage to build like a really private version of Facebook. What do, what do I know? Right? So I think privacy can be also something that's really good. So I think this is something that we for the self-driving cars need to take care of as well, that it doesn't share like personal data and so on from people. And it's doable. Okay, I'm going to okay. end up there. So let's give Dylan a round of applause. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, thank you.